All right, today's topic is going to be lung and chest wall tumors. Now, chest wall tumors can be classified by the tissue of origin, such as bone, cartilage, soft tissue, and vascular tissues. They can also be classified according to whether they're, they're benign or malignant. And so benign tumors are going to be things like osteoblastoma and osteoid osteoma, which represents tumors of the bone. They have the osteo part of it. The tumors of the cartilage are going to be chondroma and osteochondroma. Of course, that has both the chondro as well as the osteo. But osteochondroma sort of favor more of a chondroma type pattern. Some vascular anomalies are going to be hemangiomas and cystic lymphangiomas, and then tumors of the soft tissue are pretty much everything else. There's going to be the fibrous dysplasias and the eosinophilic granulomas, annular small bone cysts, giant cell tumors, mesenchymal hamartomas, lipomas, desmoid tumors, neurofibromas, etc. And then the malignant tumors, pretty much anything with sarcoma in it is going to ultimately be one of the malignant uh, chest wall tumors. And part of the problems with the chest wall tumors is that regardless of the classification, regardless of the type, regardless of the tissue, Many of them tend to be asymptomatic and are often not found um, until very late and usually incidentally. And the only exception are those masses that originate from the nerves and they might, they might present with pain instead. So ultimately I've divided this up into lung tumors and chest tumors and then into benign, malignant, and in the case of lung tumors, metastatic, just because that sort of seems to make the most sense from a classification standpoint. So starting with lung tumors, again, we're going to benign, malignant, and metastatic. Now, most pulmonary tumors in pediatrics are metastatic. Those that are primary tend to be malignant, with up to 76% being malignant and 24% being benign. And this, of course, makes sense because the benign, slow-growing tumors just haven't had an opportunity to grow slowly and manifest while the patient is still in childhood. And this is a list of some of the benign tumors, plasma cell granulomas, hamartomas, neurogenic tumors, mucous gland adenomas, myoblastomas, and benign teratomas. So starting out with the plasma cell granuloma, this is the, um, the condition of many names. Plasma cell granuloma is also called inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, fibrosanthoma, histiocytoma, and fibrohistiocytoma. It's more common in adults than children, with children making up about 8% of all cases. The average age of presentation is about 7 years old, with about 35% of children between ages 1 and 15. It is, however, the most common benign tumor in children, and it makes up about 20% of all primary lung tumors in children. Most patients are asymptomatic um, at presentation. Patients certainly can manifest with fevers, cough, pain, hemoptysis, pneumonitis, and dysphagia. The um, tumors are often found at the periphery of the lung, but some um, are found as polypoid endobronchial tumors. They do tend to be slow growing, but can also be rapidly growing and can also be locally invasive, even outside of the confines of the lung and even into the trachea. And so for that reason, treatment should really involve conservative pulmonary resection with removal of all gross disease. Now that said, recurrences can happen, and um, if they do recur, then they should also be resected. NSAIDs can also be used for large inoperable tumors, and there, there's some thought that NSAIDs will shrink them to a more readily resectable size and configuration, with the idea that NSAIDs are antigenic um, by interfering with VEGF pathway um, via the COX-2 um, um, pathway and signaling. Other things to note about plasma cell granulomas is that there can be some higher adenopathy. And this combined with local invasion and lack of planes can really make the tumor seem like a potential malignancy and um, ultimately can rule this out definitively on frozen section. That said, malignant fibrous histiocytoma is a pretty rare tumor that can mimic plasma cell granuloma. Um, you can see here in this uh, x-ray that the tumor is a very well circumscribed um, mass. It's right now in the right lower lobe and it can be, grow to be quite large and again it can be locally invasive. Hamartomas are the second most frequent benign lesion in children, and they'll often present as parenchymal lesions and can also grow to be quite large. About 25% will be calcified, and we all think of that buzzword popcorn-like as being pathognomic for hamartomas. And again, they are benign, but they can grow to be quite large, and they've been reported to cause even respiratory distress and even death in neonates. The Carney triad is a multiple neoplasia syndrome that includes pulmonary hamartoma, extradrenal paraganglionoma, gastric smooth muscle tumors, or GIST tumors, and this syndrome um, particularly afflicts young women. The treatment is conservative pulmonary resection, which might even require a lobectomy or a pneumonectomy if large enough. Endobronchial lesions are rare, but they have been reported, and these can sometimes be treated with sleeve resection when feasible.
And you can see in the x-ray here that you have that, that classic popcorn-like calcification in the right upper lobe consistent with the hamartoma. Next, moving on to some of the malignant tumors, and we're going to go through several of these. We'll start out with the bronchial adenoma. Bronchial adenomas are the most common malignant primary pulmonary tumor. They are primarily endobronchial lesions, so patients will present with symptoms of near bronchial obstruction, such as cough, recurrent pneumonitis, and hemoptysis. And you're going to start seeing a trend here. Most of these lung lesions tend to present with kind of nonspecific, um, vague symptoms like recurrent lung infections, um, a cough that won't go away. And so for this reason, diagnosis can often um, be delayed by months and even to years with patients instead being treated for lung infections or for asthma. Now, adenomas are generally considered benign, but they do have a malignant potential. The three histologic types are carcinotumor, which is the most common, which represents about 80 to 85 percent of all tumors, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and adenoid cystic carcinoma. In general, they all have a fairly good prognosis in the pediatric population. About 6% can become metastatic, and about 2% end up with a recurrence. The lesions are visualized and can be diagnosed endoscopically, but they have a tendency to bleed. So at this time, it's not advocated to try for an endoscopic resection. Instead, you can use bronchography and CT scan to um, determine the degree of bronchiectasis associated with it and really to, cl um, to clarify the, the characteristics of the lung lesion itself. If the lung is destroyed, then opting for a more morbid procedure without the benefit of having more functioning lung parenchyma doesn't really make a great deal of sense. So in general, conservative pulmonary resection or sleeve resections are the preferred therapeutic choices, and these should certainly involve um, uh, the lymphatics as well. Adenoid cystic carcinomas can spread submucosally, and so they're therefore predisposed to recurrence and or dissemination. It's part of the reason why getting those lymphatics is so important. It's also recommended that frozen section of the bronchial margins be performed at the time of the resection. We can see a CT scan here. This is an axial view CT scan. You can see that thin green arrow. That arrow is pointing to an adenoma, and you can see that it's an endobronchial lesion. It's kind of starting to occlude into the bronchus, and this one happens to be one of carcinoid um, histology. And so you can imagine that this patient might come on with, as we said, cough, hemoptysis, and recurrent infections. Next up is bronchogenic carcinoma. Bronchogenic carcinoma is also known as bronchioalveolar carcinoma. It's quite rare, but it also represents the second most common malignant primary lung lesion. Bronchogenic carcinoma is associated with cystic adenomatoid malformations and intrapulmonary bronchogenic cysts. Most are undifferentiated carcinoma or adenocarcinoma, with a squamous cell carcinoma being really quite rare. The mortality rate is quite high exceeding 90% with most children presenting with disseminated disease and an only seven month um, average survival. Treatment of the localized lesions, if you're lucky enough to find one, involves resection followed by adjuvant therapy. And you can see here an example of a bronchogenic um, carcinoma and you can see that one, they tend to be peripheral and that's um, designated by that black arrow and tends to impact the upper lobes. The one other thing you'll notice in this patient that the white arrow is pointing to is that this patient also has some right hilar adenopathy. Pleuropulmonary blastoma. I borrowed these slides from the cystic lesions of the lung and mediastinum lecture um, that was given before. Primary lung tumors in childhood are rare, but pleuropulmonary blastoma is the most common of the primary lung tumors. They arise from mesenchymal blastoma and can arise from the lung pleura or mediastinum. They do tend to arise on the right and can metastasize to the liver, brain, and spinal cord. Local recurrences are pretty frequent and they tend to be peripherally located tumors that can often be resected with a low bar or sometimes even a segmental resection. There are three histologic subtypes, cystic, cystic solid, and solid. In reality, these are all simply on the spectrum of the same disease process. We can also see this based on the age the patient's diagnosed. When diagnosed younger, in other words, kind of here an average of 10 months, we're more likely to find cystic lesions, followed by the mixed cystic solid, and in older children, even up to an, age, an average age of 41 months, we're more likely to find solid tumors.
So not surprisingly, the more immature younger cystic lesions have an improved survival of up to 91%, whereas survival drops off when diagnosed later or when we get to the tumor um, when it's more solid. The sexy thing about pleuropleuropulmonary blastoma is one that of the primary lung tumors is pretty frequent, um, but also there's an interesting genetic component to it. Um, there's a genetic predisposition in up to 30% of cases, and this is otherwise known as um, PPB1, pleuropulmonary blastoma 1, which has been shown to promote pleuropulmonary blastoma pathogenesis. There are heterozygous mutations in 66% of PPB cases, and it's been shown that DICER1 um, is both necessary and sufficient for the initiation of a phenotypic um, pleuropulmonary blastoma in a MURI model. DICER1 is also found to be active in the pseudoglandular stage, where an ablation of DICER1 leads to cysts involving the distal airway epithelium, and those cysts, of course, do mimic those um, early cysts that we see in pleuropulmonary blastoma. For the treatment, I do bring up a study by um, Priest et al. This is a retrospective review of infants with pleuropulmonary blastoma type 1. And the reason that they studied this is because they wanted to determine whether surgery alone versus surgery plus adjuvant chemotherapy led to a um, significant decrease in, in um, uh, mortality as well as uh, time to recurrence. Type 2 and type 3 are pretty standard. You would treat them with new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by resection. And there really is much of a question there, but the study really wanted to kind of identify whether or not that adjuvant chemotherapy is necessary. So first, if we look at the surgery alone, this was um, uh, uh, 20 patients. You can see the chemotherapy group is um, is listed as the black squares with the, ha with the um, hashed line, and those who did not receive chemotherapy are listed in, in green excuse me, in gray. And so you can see that there is a decreased recurrence-free survival for the patients who only received uh, surgery and no chemotherapy. But if you look now on panel B, and again, the chemotherapy is listed in black, and those who did not receive chemotherapy is listed in gray, we see that although there was a decreased recurrence-free survival, the overall survival was not significantly different. And so this does suggest that um, perhaps the addition of chemotherapy is maybe not um, in the patient's best interest. But there are a few problems with the study. One is the low sample size, which is consistent with the relatively low incidence of the disease. Um, the patients involved in the analysis were a mix of registry and literature data, so they were not prospectively reviewed. But this also suggests that there's a lack of standardization in treatment and follow-up. And along these lines, you can see in this table that the patients were treated with a whole host of different regimens. And um, the question is whether is how much you can actually garner from this study given the sample size and given the fact that they were not treated um, according to a standard regimen. The follow-up for these patients is to do a CT scan every six months to detect recurrence for up to six years. Now as I mentioned type 2 and type 3 tumors are all treated with new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by resection and you'll note that the chemotherapy regimen which includes incristin, dactinomycin, cyclophosphate, doxorubicin, ifosamide, etoposide, carboplatin, cisoplatin. This chemotherapy regimen is very very similar to that used in Wilms tumor and that makes sense since both of them are tumors that are based out of mesenchymal origin. Next, I'm going to present a couple of cases to highlight the range of presentations of these types of tumors. The first is a four-month-old girl who presented to her primary care physician with tachypnea and decreased breast sounds on the left, but no history of lung issues. Her history was otherwise unremarkable, but interestingly was a carrier Pompe disease. She gets the following x-ray, which shows a dominantly cystic lesion in the left hemithorax, for which there was an initial thought that perhaps this could represent a CLE or congenital lobar emphysema. Of course, we do dislike getting CT scans in kids, but we ultimately decided that it would be in the patient's best interest to go ahead and get some cross-sectional imaging, and where we see a macrocystic lung lesion with thin filmy septations and just a small bit of lung parenchyma at the base. We also see, it is evident on the x-ray, that there is some degree of mediastinal shift. So the patient undergoes a thoracotomy with a left upper lobectomy, and the pathology reveals the following. Multiple cysts ranging in size from 2.8 to 4 centimeters is separated by thin, delicate membranous septa lined by bland, flat, cuboidal alveolar type epithelium, measuring less than 0.2 centimeters in thickness. The septa mostly contained fibrous background stroma with patchy hypercellular and hypocellular areas. 
a distinctive hypercellular cambium-like layer beneath a benign epithelial lining containing ovoid to spindled primitive mesenchymal cells. And that's kind of our buzzword for plural pulmonary blastoma is the spindled mesenchymal cells. With some mitotic activity, occasional apoptotic cells and moderate nuclear pleomorphism was present. No tumor cell anaplasia or septal overgrowth by immature mesenchymal cells was identified. No normal lung tissue nodules or masses were identified. The patient had an ultimately ended up having a totally unremarkable post-operative course, and the decision was made to proceed with routine surveillance. And you can see three months later how great her CT scan um, looks. She's remained without respiratory symptoms. Her CT scan shows this excellent lung expansion without evidence of disease recurrence. And she's going to undergo surveillance CT scans every three months for one year, followed by every six months, and again, usually up to about six years, with further management depending on symptoms, or hopefully not in this case, development of recurrence. The next case is that of an 11-month-old girl who presented with a one-week history of a, dirty, of a dry cough with rhinorrhea and congestion, but no constitutional symptoms. She had been exposed to a sick nephew the week prior. She was otherwise a term healthy baby. Her parents had chosen not to vaccinate her, and she presented with a mild leukocytosis with a white count of 14,400, and her respiratory viral panel revealed that she was positive for rhino enterovirus. Her chest x-ray revealed a rather impressive uh, white out of the left chest, which was initially presumed to be a, a pleural fusion. So she had a pigtail catheter placed that acquired 300 cc's of serous output, but she still had a persistent pleural fusion on chest x-ray. And for that reason, we ended up um, initiating three days of intrapleural um, ultiplase. And the fluid turned a little bit serosanguinous, which at that time was just due, was um, considered to be presumed to be due to irritation of the chest wall from that TPA or ultiplase. Her chest x-ray ultimately demonstrated a modest improvement in the infusion, and so she was subsequently discharged home after her symptoms were um, improved and after her chest tube was removed. Two weeks later, she presented with a decrease in her cough, but her parents had noted an increase in lethargy. So she underwent a CT scan, which reveals a large solid mass in the left hemithorax. Her tumor markers were negative, and biopsy revealed, again, as that spindle cell sarcomatoid malignant neoplasm. Bone scan and MRI were negative for extrapulmonary disease. She ultimately underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy with the phosphamide, dactinomycin, doxorubicin, and mucristine. Her hospital and chemotherapy course sadly were complicated by acute respiratory failure requiring intubation, hypercalcemia malignancy, rhabdomyolysis, acute kidney injury requiring peritoneal dialysis, intermittent vasopressor um, support, febrile neutropenia, staph epidermidis bacteremia, and a candida pneumonia. Following a fairly prolonged hospital course, though, she has been recovering well, and a CT scan performed three months after initiating uh, the treatment revealed improvement in the mass, suggestive of a uh, continued response to the pleuropulmonary blastoma to chemotherapy. And again, you can see how well this patient has responded to her neovaginal chemotherapy with both lungs very nicely inflated, and we do not see any radiographic evidence of a pleuropulmonary blastoma. Next, moving into rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyosarcoma of the lung is quite rare. It makes up only 0.5%, excuse me, of all childhood rhabdomyosarcomas. Many are endobronchial in origin, but others have reported them originating from um, congenital cystic anomalies. In general, congenital cystic anomalies can be falsely reassuring, and they might actually harbor malignancies such as a rhabdomyosarcoma, or a pulmonary blastoma, or bronchogenic carcinoma, or mesenchymoma. And so this is one reason why many surgeons will advocate for resection, even in those patients who are asymptomatic. It is more common to have another site of rhabdomyosarcoma that um, metastasizes to the lung. Of those patients with metastasis, 39% are found in the lung. So in the somewhat bizarre fashion that's rhabdomyosarcoma risk stratification, we have to kind of determine what the um, pre-operative risk factors are as well as the post-operative risk factors. And so we can see that in this initial um, staging system, which is kind of the pre-operative um, staging, that uh, the um, lung and chest wall kind of fall into the category of et cetera or under, uh, et cetera or other. Um, so 
We know for a fact that chest and lung wall tumors are automatically going to be a stage two or greater, since none of them fit into those one of any of those favorable sites, which includes like the orbit, the head and neck, um, urology, prostate. And then following the staging, then you use your uh, post-op criteria where you determine how localized the disease is. If it was locally diseased and completely resected, then it goes into group one. If there's any uh, positive margins or regional disease, then it goes to group two. Group three is, suggests there was an incomplete resection or biopsy and this in the setting of having gross residual disease remaining. And of course, four is where there's distant metastasis. And then you put this together, the pretreatment stage and the clinical group, and you can stratify these patients into low one and two intermediate or high risk group. And one thing you see is that embryonal um, is somewhat um, more pro common than, uh, than alveolar. Uh, because they are all at least a pretreatment stage two through four, the majority of these kids are either in the low two versus intermediate and high stage right off the bat. Moving on to metastasis, as mentioned, pulmonary metastasis is far more common uh, than primary tumors, and the surgical approach is dictated by the histology of the underlying tumor and the response to chemotherapy. Generally, pulmonary metastases are not um, tackled until the primary tumor has been treated without evidence of recurrence and with no other evidence of other metastatic disease, with the exception of Wilms tumor. The most common tumors that are considered for pulmonary metastectomy are osteosarcoma, soft tissue sarcoma, and Wilms tumor. So let's talk about Wilms tumor first. Pulmonary resection is rarely required. If a patient is diagnosed with pulmonary metastasis in the setting of a Wilms tumor, this does not preclude them from upfront surgical resection, nor does it require new adjuvant chemotherapy. If the mass is not surgically receptible, re, excuse me, resectable, or you are electing to perform a renal sparing approach in some selective circumstance, such as um, bilateral um, kidney involvement or in a patient who has just one kidney, um, and then if the mass is not surgically resectable or you're electing to perform um, this uh, renal sparing approach, then you'd consider new adjuvant chemotherapy. But the new adjuvant chemotherapy instead will be treating the Wilms tumor. It, by nature, will end up um, helping the pulmonary metastasis, but the pulmonary metastasis is not the reason for giving the, the, the chemotherapy. For those patients who do have radiographic resolution, if you compare patients who did and did not receive postoperative radiotherapy, the difference in, uh, oh, excuse me, this is a CT scan, um, and we can see that the, there's a metastasis right up on the right lateral aspect of that right lower lobe. Unfortunately, I put it in the lung phase, so you can't see the Wilms tumors as well, but you can see that there's bilateral Wilms tumors. And in this child, we elected to try for a renal sparing approach, mainly trying to preserve that left kidney. So this child did undergo new adjuvant chemotherapy with the idea of trying to shrink those Wilms tumors to optimize our chances of a renal sparing approach. Um, even though there were metastases, if we were able to simply resect it or both of them um, with less concern, we would still do that even in the setting of a pulmonary metastasis. Now, if you compare patients who did and did not receive postoperative radiotherapy, the, um, the difference in disease-free survival is really not super impressive. It's 62.5 versus 75%. So if there is radiographic resolution after six weeks of therapy with vincristin, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin, then whole lung radiation is not required. If there is no resolution, uh, then add cyclophosphamide and topicide in addition to lung radiation. And if the lesion still persists, then I would consider biopsying it first to verify that it is indeed still cancerous tissue, and only then would I consider a metastectomy. Osteosarcoma. Unlike Wilms tumors, patients with osteosarcoma are candidates for pulmonary metastectomy only once the primary lesion is eradicated, or at least controlled. Disease-free survival is about 40% in patients with metachronous pulmonary metastases. Factors such as the number of lesions, timing of development, and recurrence all factor into the overall survival. Now, not surprisingly, less nodules is affiliated with improved survival. 
and this is kind of arbitrarily found to be at four nodules. Also not surprisingly is that if the metastasis invades the parietal pleura, there's a poor prognosis and complete resection is affiliated with an improved outcome. If complete resection of the metastasis can happen, then we're usually pretty aggressive about getting all the lesions because there is in fact an improvement in survival. Now historically, this has usually meant routinely performing an open approach so that you have the benefit of feeling the nodules that you cannot otherwise see, ideally improving the chances of getting them all out at the first shot. Now, now we're a little bit more liberal and willing to perform the procedures thoracoscopically, recognizing that even if we do lose some of that tactile feedback, we also know that we can always perform repeat metastectomies if necessary, and this is still demonstrated a survival advantage while decreasing morbidity. There's been one patient that described in the literature that's undergone five pulmonary metastectomies. You can see in this image, this patient has multiple metastectomies. They've, they've demonstrated three in this cup, but there's several other metastases even in this axial field alone. Um, at my old institution, our surgeons would usually do thoracoscopic metastectomies, and only once did I um, observe them under doing a clamshell thoracotomy. And this was a very specific case of a kid who'd had an osteosarcoma with metastases, but he was traveling back to St. Kitts where they had one CT scanner on the entire island and he would not be able to get the same degree of follow-up. And so it was just so much more important that we made sure that we got every single last one of the metastases. And then lastly, for what we'll be discussing for the metastases um, is soft tissue sarcoma. Now, whether or not the patient will benefit from the resection is really dependent on the histologic subtype of the soft tissue sarcoma. Pulmonary metastectomy is rarely required in rhabdomyosarcoma. Ewing sarcoma pulmonary metastectomy has not demonstrated treatment efficacy either. For other soft tissue sarcomas, as long as the primary tumor is under control and complete resection is possible, it is worth considering for resection. Long-term prognosis is going to be very much dictated by the time to developing the pulmonary metastases, the number of lesions, as well as the tumor doubling time. Only about 10 to 20 percent of patients are salvaged by pulmonary metastectomy. And then um, what we see here is a, a chest x-ray that demonstrates an example of a metastatic synovial sarcoma to the lungs. And that's it for lung tumors, so let's move on to chest wall tumors. Now chest wall tumors are really quite rare and they only have an incidence of um, just over 2%, but up to two-thirds of them are malignant, so if you have them it's probably going to be bad. Now 55% of them arise from the chest wall and about 45% arise from the soft tissue. But in general, the embryonic origin is mesenchymal. Of course, because they're mesenchymal in nature, the most common malignant tumors are sarcomatous, whereas carcinomas are pretty rare, if not non-existent. Five-year survival is only about 60%, but there is a high recurrence rate of 50%, with recurrences associated with subsequent five-year survival of only about 17%. The um, common theme we're going to find for all these chest wall tumors is that they tend to present the same way, they tend to diagnose the same way, tissue diagnosis is important, and they're all, pretty much all treated the same way. So from a presentation standpoint, most of them present with a painless bump, often infants and young children, uh, and it's noted by caregivers. Um, but since it can be a slow-growing mass, it may take a while before the reluctant teenager finally mentions it, or before it's incidentally found on chest imaging, that happens about 20% of the time. Every once in a while, patients will present with pain, but that's usually in the cases of malignant tumors. Malignant tumors tend to have a kind of a shiny skin appearance because the skin is stretched over the mass. They all present with, again, those really nonspecific vague symptoms such as tachypnea, hypoxia, cough, dyspnea on exertion. Um, and if you start having respiratory symptoms, it does suggest the lesion has grown a bit because it suggests that there's some degree of mass effect on the pulmonary parenchyma or intrusion into the pleural space or malignant effusion. Um, this is often related to a delay in seeking care, again, due to these nonspecific symptoms. When you're evaluating these patients, a family history, travel history, history of injury are all important components of the, of the history and physical. And if the patient is having respiratory symptoms, it's useful to consider doing pulmonary function tests as well. For diagnosis, we always start with a chest x-ray. We're evaluating location, size, whether or not there's calcifications present, if there's any osseous involvement, any underlying parenchymal disease. You might use an ultrasound to evaluate any um, echogenic features, such as solid versus cystic, the degree of homogeneity, as well as vascularity. 
But of course the gold standard is really going to be some, some degree of cross-sectional imaging which can include a CT scan or an MRI. And this will really allow you to precisely delineate the anatomy of the mass with regards to the bony, vascular, and soft tissue structures. The obvious disadvantage to the CT scan is the radiation exposure, and the advantage to the MRI is not only the delineation of soft tissue, but also neuro involvement um, while eliminating that radiation exposure. Cross-sectional imaging is um, especially useful for kind of being able to determine if it's a benign versus a malignant pathology. Some other imaging studies you might consider are going to be a brain or abdominal CT scan, bone scan, PET scan, um, all of course depend on the lesion type, but again looking for metastases. Generally, the combination of PET CT scan not only assesses the primary tumor, but really yields information on not only metastases, but also local regional lymph node basins, um, any evidence of recurrence, and can also be used to monitor response to therapy. And then definitive diagnosis can um, be established with tissue diagnosis. Now for tissue diagnosis, those tumors that are thought to be benign or less than three centimeters, we usually will just go ahead and do an excisional biopsy ideally with a rim of normal tissues circumferentially for comparison purposes. Larger masses, or those that are fixed, involve um, other structures, um, or thought to be malignant, should undergo core needle biopsy or incisional biopsy. And then of course, as usual for incisional biopsies, the incision should be oriented in such a way as to support the future incision um, uh, in the future. The treatment for pretty much all of these is resection. Um, it's going to be somewhat tumor specific, but in general they're malignant lesions and they require multimodal therapy, whereas benign lesions you can usually get away with just that initial excisional biopsy. As with all tumors, the key is to establish those negative margins to decrease the chance of recurrence um, and requirement for additional subsequent therapy. For larger tumors with a result in large defect, you might um, also need to start thinking about reconstruction. Those that are greater than five centimeters will often need reconstruction and possibly the use of prosthetic materials or flaps such as pedicled or free flaps, and that can include a latissimus dorsi, a rectus abdominis, or even the pectus major. The one important thing to recognize is that those free flaps, those are going to grow at least to some extent with the patient, but the prosthetic materials are not, and so it can sometimes lead to some degree of chest wall deformity. Um, it can lead to um, a, basically a foot essentially a flail chest, some degree of scoliosis. Um, now those that are superior posterior, you can also you can often get away with resecting slightly larger lesions, and that's because you um, have the scapula there, which can help really buttress that defect. Benign tumors usually tend to, um, they average about 3.2 centimeters, whereas malignant tumors average about 7.2 centimeters. So looking at the size themselves can also really help to distinguish um, benign from malignant tumors. So let's go through some benign chest wall lesions. We'll start with the aneurysmal bone cyst. These can be found anywhere on the chest wall. They do generally arise from the ribs. They can be quite large and locally invasive and the treatment is complete excision. Recurrence is pretty rare, and the histology will show some blood-filled cysts composed of fibrous tissue and giant cells. You can see the CT scan here that it shows this really expansive um, mass that arises from the posterior part of the left fifth to sixth rib area, and it's causing destruction of the associated transverse process of the vertebra vertebral body, um, including the left half of the vertebral body of the fifth dorsal vertebra. Um, and you can see that there's a really large intrathoracic and posterior mediastinal component. Chondroma, of course, we know it's going to be cartilage. These tend to be slow growing and painless. They generally rise from the costal um, cartilages, so we usually see them at the anterior chest wall at the costochondral junction. On imaging, we'll see lytic lesions with sclerotic margins, and these can be really difficult to distinguish from chondrosarcomas using imaging alone. The treatment, therefore, is going to be complete excision with a wide margin in case there is a sarcomatous component. And you can see here that um, this lesion, as we would expect, is um, in the anterior chest wall right at that costochondral junction. Next, we'll talk about desmoid tumors. Desmoid tumors are fibrous neoplasms that can really be located anywhere. They're generally benign, but they can undergo malignant degeneration. They are locally infiltrative and they travel down fascial planes. They can encase neurovascular structures in both the mediastinum or the thoracic inlet. 
The treatment for these is going to be wide local excuse me, excision with negative margins um, with radiation and chemotherapy um, if complete resection is not possible or if vital structures are involved. If you're able to um, excise it with negative margins, then in general you can avoid that chemo radi um, chemoradiation. Um, if you do end up requiring chemotherapy, then your drugs um, are going to be um, excuse me, that's a typo there, it's going to be vinblastine, methotrexate, tamoxifen, and diclofenac. And you can see that the margin status is really important. If you have negative margins, you have about a 10% recurrence. If you have positive margins, you have a really high recurrence rate of 75%. And that's where the chemo radiation comes, um, comes into play. And again, these do tend to be benign. They do tend to be relatively slow growing, but you can see that they can get very, very large and they can be locally infiltrative. Next, we'll look into fibrous dysplasia. Fibrous dysplasia is where normal bone is replaced by um, fibrous tissue. They tend to be benign. They're often not very large. The presentation is usually pain, and there's often an association with uh, a pathologic fracture. On chest x-ray, um, you'll see a lytic lesion with this quote-unquote soap bubble appearance, and the treatment is simple excision. You can see the chest x-ray here um, on the right side, that fourth rib. You can see that it looks unusual. That is evidence of fibrous dysplasia. It doesn't have that characteristic soap bubble appearance that they describe, but you can see pretty nicely what it would look like on your, on your chest film. Um, mesenchymal hamartomas, they tend to um, affect infants and young children and tend to be antenatally diagnosed. They tend to be well circumscribed uh, lesions, but they emanate from the chest wall and they can abut or compress thoracic structures. They will present with the usual nonspecific respiratory symptoms. And on imaging, you might find some mineralization and hemorrhagic cystic structures. Um, on histology, you'll find chondroid tissue um, with blood filled endothelial line spaces interspersed with osteoclastic uh, giant cells. The treatment is going to be resection with chest wall uh, reconstruction. And again, keep in mind that there tends to be a relatively large lesion, and if they're um, diagnosed in infants and young children, then they're associated with a relatively small chest cavity. So the defect can be quite considerable, as can the degree of respiratory compromise and associated scoliosis. Since they're benign and there are no reports of undergoing malignant degeneration, there is a little bit of wiggle room in that you do not need to treat them immediately with excision, and you can attempt some less morbid procedures such as radiofrequency ablation first. And here you can see a classic, um, classic image of a mesenchymal hamartoma. And again, the biopsy of a mesenchymal hamartoma will demonstrate hyaline cartilage, um, fascicles of spindle cells, and bone and hemorrhagic cysts. And the last benign lesion that we'll cover is the osteochondroma, which has both bony and cartilaginous elements, but it behaves more like a cartilaginous tumor. There is a male pre um, preponderance, three to one. Many patients will present with pain, and this can also be uh, due to a pathologic fracture or possibly compression of some nearby nerves. Those patients who are asymptomatic, it suggests that that osteochondroma is probably growing inward towards the thoracic cavity because it takes quite a bit of compression of the lung and structures before you get to the point where a patient's symptomatic from a respiratory standpoint. On imaging, you'll find that um, it arises from a cortex of rib, usually at the metaphysis, and you might see uh, this cartilage cap. They do tend to be benign, but there, has been, um, there have been reports of malignant degeneration. And the treatment is resection provided the patient is postpubertal, symptomatic, and if it's growing. And then moving into the malignant chest tumors, I mentioned this before, but most malignant tumors of the chest wall in pediatrics are sarcomas. Um, and so we'll briefly mention chondrosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, and rhabdomyosarcoma. Obviously, there are several others um, that we won't um, really be hitting too much on. The treatment of all of these tumors is ultimately surgical resection. 
Um, the other important thing is it's really necessary to assess the number of ribs that need to be resected by imaging because if you need to resect five or more ribs, that can really, really significantly impair chest wall function. And so you have to really consider on an individual basis what the, um, what the perioperative plan is, um, depending on the location of the tumor and the number of ribs involved. So let's talk about chondrosarcoma first. Chondrosarcomas, just like their uh, chondroma counterparts, originate from the costal cartilages, and they are the most common primary malignant bone tumor in adults. They are more common in males, and they often have an association with a prior history of trauma. Chondromas are benign, but they can undergo malignant degeneration to become chondrosarcomas, and about 10% of patients will present with metastasis, usually to the lungs and to the brain. Treatment involves surgical resection, ideally with a margin of at least four centimeters of normal tissue, and this is due to the high risk of local recurrence. In patients with positive margins, recurrence rates are up to 75%, but even those with negative margins have recurrence rates of 10%. These tumors are very chemo-unresponsive, um, so radiation therapy is generally used for those patients with unresectable tumors or with positive margins. <clears throat> Five-year survival ranges from anywhere between 60 and 90 percent, and the only known beneficial prognostic factors are the absence of metastasis at presentation and um, establishing a complete surgical resection. This axial CT image represents a fairly typical CT appearance of an anterior chest wall chondrosarcoma arising from the chondrosternal junction. The lesion demonstrates prominent chondroid matrix mineralization, resulting in a characteristic flocculent, or again, that kind of popcorn pattern of calcification. Ewing sarcoma is also known as primitive neuroectodermal tumors, and they are the most common malignant chest wall tumor in the pediatric population. They tend to be quite aggressive, they often present as painful metastases, and have frequent metastases. 25% of them will, will present with metastases already established, and they usually go to the lung, bone, or bone marrow. There is an identified genetic anomaly that's associated with it, and this is the T1122 translocation, which when present is diagnostic. Histologically, the tumors have sheets of small round cells with scant cytoplasm, and imaging reveals lytic or sclerotic lesions, which represents bony destruction. Treatment is multimodal and starts with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This will involve incristin, adriamycin, cyclophosphamide, and adriamycin alternating with etoposide and ethosphamide. The addition of neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to surgical excision improves the rate of negative margins from 37 to 71%. Surgery must include excision of any involved structures, whether it be soft tissue or osseous margin. Now, in primary or metastatic Ewing sarcoma or osteosarcoma, historically we've always said that you need to have one rib and one below for gross margins of the tumor in order to attain a complete resection. That is no longer considered to be the case. At this point, we say negative margins. And part of that is due to the morbidity of the, um, the rib excision and the chest wall resection. And part of it is due to the fact that it didn't really demonstrate um, a marked improvement in, uh, in recurrence rates. <clears throat> that said, it is important in a malignant tumor such as a Ewing sarcoma that all areas of dense fibrotic scar um, be removed, or if you feel um, sort of like the tissue is abnormal, then it would suggest that that should be removed with your specimen. And that's because it could harbor some small microscopic areas of tumor and produce a positive resection margin. In malignant tumors, it's generally accepted that a one centimeter margin is required to, to achieve um, a microscopically negative margin. For osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma or other malignant tumors, if the lung is adherent to the tumor, a wedge resection of the adherent lung should be resected with the tumor, and this avoids disrupting the capsule of the tumor, which would again otherwise produce a, pa a positive pathologic margin. If the diaphragm is adherent, this should also be removed as well. Adjuvant therapy is also used and involves the same chemotherapy regimen. Radiotherapy is used in the cases of residual or unresectable disease or malignant pleural fusion. Um, it is a radiosensitive tumor, but radiation is otherwise avoided given the risks of scoliosis, pneumonitis, cardiotoxicity, secondary malignancy, growth retardation, and then of course the um, spectrum of breast hypoplasia, aplasia, or cancer.
Survival for this condition is overall fairly poor. Five-year survival, if there's no metastasis, reaches 70%, whereas eight-year survival for those patients with metastasis reaches just about 30%. Of note, patients with metastasis should be considered for stem cell rescue after myeloablative chemotherapy. And you can see here's just this really destructive Ewing sarcoma, and you can see that there's also an associated malignant pleural effusion with it. Next, looking at fibrosarcoma. This is also known as infantile or congenital fibrosarcoma. These are malignant tumors that can be found anywhere throughout the body in infants, including the chest wall. They do tend to be locally invasive, and they have a genetic basis, which involves a gene rearrangement between the TEL gene and the TRKC gene. Um, they also are approached by a multimodal approach, and they are quite chemosensitive. They tend to be treated with neoadjuvant bincristin, actinomycin, cyclophosphamide, and adriamycin, followed by surgical excision. Five-year survival is generally quite good at about 89%, with an event-free survival of 81%. You can see in this coronal CT scan that there's a large mass with a heterogeneous density component, and this is in the chest while it's invading the ribs, the pleura, as well as the right lung. This patient underwent a, a mastectomy and radiation therapy uh, two years earlier. Second to last, osteosarcoma. These can be a primary or a secondary tumor, such as in prior sites of irradiation, like the in the CT scan we just saw, um, although that patient, of course, had a fibrosarcoma instead. And this can also be from pre-existing osseous lesions, such as in uh, Paget's disease. Primary tumors are often affiliated with the ribs and can mix up with chondrosarcomas. Imaging would reveal a sunburst pattern on chest x-ray, and additional imaging should be performed to rule out metastasis, which includes bony skip lesions and distant metastases such as lung, liver, and brain. Biopsies performed prior to therapy and therapies initiated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgical resection. Prognosis is not unexpectedly related to the presence of metastasis, the degree of the tumor burden, and response to chemotherapy. It's fairly poor with a 15 to 20% overall survival, but a five-year survival rate exceeding 50%. And you can see in the, um, in the image here, we have just this large destructive lesion involving the chest wall. And the last for the malignant lung tumors, we're gonna talk about rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyosarcoma of the chest wall, like the lung, is fairly rare, and it's considered a fairly unfavorable site. Uh, I'm not going to show those same tables from before, but they are identically also um, considered one of the higher stages because they're not in one of the favorable um, anatomic regions of the body. And then as we know, other prognostic factors include histopathology, in other words, alveolar versus embryonal, tumor burden and size, completeness of resection, metastatic disease presence, and that will also include lymph node involvement. Recently, fusion status has been shown to be more prognostic than even um, uh, histologic descript descriptions. Um, that fusion um, protein is PAX3, FOX01, um, and this is produced by a, a genomic translocation, which ultimately characterizes the alveolar subtype of rhabdomyosarcoma. More than 70% of alveolar um, rhabdo tumors carry a balanced T213 chromosomal translocation that leads to the production of these two um, fusion genes. And those patients whose tumors are fusion positive tend to have a worse prognosis than those whose tumors are uh, fusion negative, regardless of histology. That said, most tumors that are fusion positive are alveolar subtype. Now, of course, unfavorable sites tend to have a worse prognosis as compared with um, uh, more favorable sites, and that will increase the, which has an increased survival from 55% to 90%. The treatment involves a multimodal approach, which again includes new adjuvant chemotherapy, followed by surgical excision. Um, in chest wall rhabdomyosarcoma, it's been shown that patients with an R1 or positive microscopic margin um, and those with R0 um, negative margins have equivalent long-term survival. So, <coughs> excuse me, rhabdomyosarcoma is very radiation sensitive and radiation therapy can be delivered postoperatively if post if um, if we find positive microscopic margins on our histology.
radiation is also reserved for those tumors that are unresectable. Now interestingly, the COG, the Children's Oncology Group, has studied chest wall rhabdomyosarcoma and found that the factor that influences failure, um, free and overall survival the greatest is whether or not there is metastasis. And this takes into account clinical group, histology, subtype, and tumor size. Patients with metastasis have an overall survival of 7% as compared with 61% of those without metastasis. <coughs> the image here is um, that of a 14-year-old boy who presented with one week history of dyspnea, tachypnea, and swelling of the chest wall. And we can see an axillary CT scan that shows this right anterior mediastinal and chest wall mass, um, as well as some right axillary lymphadenopathy. We can also see that there is a fairly large right malignant pleural effusion with enhancing pleural nodules and thickening. And this is, um, he was ultimately diagnosed with rhabdomyosarcoma. So I think the one thing we can say for malignant chest wall tumors universally is that they undergo new adjuvant chemotherapy first prior to surgical excision. And in general, they tend to have a fairly poor prognosis as compared with other tumors. Um, and finally, metastases are always a bad thing, but chest wall metastases really seem to be a particular challenge, both for the treating physician as well as for the patient. And let's move on to do just a couple of quick questions. First question. An 11-year-old girl presents with chest pain and a droopy eyelid. A CT scan reveals a large chest wall mass. Core biopsy reveals a small round blue cell tumor with homo right rosettes and the tumor is CD99 positive, MIC2 positive. Which of the following is a poor prognostic factor for this chest wall tumor? vertebral junction location. Uh, primitive neuroectodermal tumors, whether it's PNET or um, Askin Rasai tumors, are the most common pediatric chest wall malignancy, encompassing 17% of, um, of chest wall malignancies and represent 6 to 11% of all uh, PNETs. Symptomatically, they might present as a painful chest wall mass associated with cough, dyspnea, weight loss, and Horner syndrome. Characteristically, CT scan um, imaging reveals a heterogeneous soft tissue mass, often with rib erosion and or pleural fusion. Chest wall peanuts are rare, rapidly progressive, small round cell tumors that are on a spectrum with Ewing sarcoma, but that originate from embryonic cells of the neural crest. So they can be differentiated from Ewing sarcoma by the identification of Homer right rosettes um, and expression of NSE, neuron specific enolase. CD99 and neurosecretory granules on electron microscopy. Now, similar to Ewing sarcoma, they are best treated with multimodal therapy. That therapy is, of course, going to be new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgical resection um, and plus or minus postoperative radiation therapy. This sequence leads to a greater complete resection rate and improved event free survival. Even patients who respond well to initial chemotherapy should undergo surgical resection because it's been associated with an improved event-free survival compared to chemotherapy and radiotherapy without surgery. Reported negative prognostic factors include a cost of vertebral location, the duration of symptoms, the presence of metastatic disease, a larger primary size, and an inability to perform a complete resection. Question two. A two-week-old female presents with a large mass of the posterior chest wall without respiratory distress. The mass is not tender, um, smooth, and it appears to be associated with several ribs. Magnetic resonance imaging demonstrates a solid extrapleural mass suggestive of a mesenchymal hamartoma involving three ribs, and this is confirmed by biopsy. The best management option for chest wall mesenchymal hamartoma is... Observation. Mesenchymal hamartomas are rare benign tumors that are often identified at birth or in early childhood. Other terms used for this entity um, includes benign mesenchymoma, osteochondrosarcoma, osteochondroma, congenital atypical benign chondroblastoma, and malignant mesenchymoma. 
They are well circumscribed masses and they represent a focal overgrowth of skeletal elements. Mesenchymal hamartomas can be single or they can be multiple and they tend to be more common in males. They usually present as an asymptomatic chest mass, although large hamartomas can cause mass effect affecting cardiorespiratory function. Radiographs reveal an expansile mass with cortical destruction involving one or often multiple ribs with an extrapleural soft tissue component. Matrix mineralization can be seen with CT. Uh, um, MRI um, can depict hemorrhagic cystic regions. And the differential diagnosis includes Ewing sarcoma, peripheral primitive uh, neurectoneural tumor, metastatic neuroblastoma, and congenital fibrosarcoma. Biopsy demonstrates a hypercellular lesion with mature elements of bone, cartilage, and fibroblasts. These hypercellular features can be confused with malignancy, although nuclear atypia and hyperchromatism is not seen. While surgical resection was advocated in the past, this can be a sanguine resection and result in large chest wall defects requiring complicated reconstruction. Reports of malignant degeneration, metastasis, and recurrence after total resection have not been published for this tumor, and these tumors can be followed expectantly. As the infant grows, these lesions often remain stable and become less physiologically significant. Question 3. A 9-year-old boy has a large chest mass extending into the thorax with a pleural effusion. An incisional biopsy of the mass returns a small, round, blue cell tumor with an 1122 translocation. The next best step in management of this patient with a chest wall mass is... Neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Ewing sarcoma and peanuts are thought to be part of the same spectrum as we mentioned before. The evidence supporting this is that they both have that same 11 to 22 chromosomal translocation. Now, despite the fact that peanut originates from the intercostal neuronal tissue and Ewing comes from the rib directly, the only really clear way to distinguish between these two diseases is by electron microscopy. Peanut has neurosecretory granules that are identifiable in the cytoplasm, whereas Ewing's does not. The overall five-year survival stage for stage for peanut was classically thought to be 15 to 20 percent worse than Ewing's, however that may not be the case. What is known is that um, for completely resectable chest wall diseases with no distant metastasis, the outcome is favorable with event-free survival rates reported as high as 65 percent. Chest wall Ewing's um, tumors should be treated in a manner similar to Ewing's tumors found elsewhere in the body. Chemotherapy prior to surgery is definitely recommended because it tends to avoid better local control and less extensive surgery, as well as the ability to treat microscopic distant lesions and thus also a higher chance of obtaining um, a tumor-free state and also um, obtaining negative margins at the time of a subsequent resection. Um, in other words, 71% of patients as opposed to only 37% with their initial resection. Performing a primary resection without initial chemotherapy causes an increase from 50 to 74 percent in the need for radiotherapy, according to intergroup studies. Formal lobectomy is not required for resectable extension into the pulmonary parenchyma. You can easily do simply a wedge resection, which will help preserve pulmonary function but will still maintain the tumor capsule intact. Pleurodesis is not applicable in this setting, and the primary treatment for malignant effusion is chemotherapy. Question 4. Following nephrectomy, a 4-year-old male with a favorable histology Wilms tumor has a normal chest plane radiograph, but multiple lung metastases visible and chest CT scan. The most effective treatment to improve event-free survival in this patient with metastatic Wilms tumor is... Vincristin, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin. Event free survival at the, um, is, excuse me, is a time span after treatment of malignancy during which there is no objective sign of recurrence. In the COG protocols, for patients with favorable histology Wilms tumor and lung metastases, the lung nodules are reassessed after six weeks of chemotherapy. Radiation therapy is omitted if there has been a complete response. The rationale for this is that um, they demonstrated in an NWTS 4 and 5 trial that, that again, those with favorable histology Wilms tumor and nodules seen only on CT scan um, 
that uh, the five-year event-free survival was greater for patients receiving three drugs, in other words, vincristin, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin, with or without lung irradiation, than those receiving two drugs, um, just the vincristin and dactinomycin alone. There was no benefit in five-year overall survival with the addition of doxorubicin or pulmonary radiation. The lung is the most common metastatic site of Wilms tumor, and chest radiographs ha have historically been used to assess patients for, um, for lung metastases, but chest CT scans are, as you can imagine, much more sensitive. And then on the um, NWTS5 study, um, they looked at 129 patients that had lung lesions detected on CT scan, but not by chest radiograph. <clears throat> uh, lung nodules are considered to have um, tumor unless proven negative by biopsy. <clears throat> and in those patients who have residual lesions and get biopsied, only about 74% of them actually have or um, are harboring a malignancy in those areas. So some of them are just um, scar tissue. And um, for that reason, biopsy can sometimes be useful. Question 5. A 4-year-old female presents with a unilateral 5-centimeter renal tumor confined to the upper pole of the left kidney. CT reveals multiple lesions in both lungs, and she is otherwise asymptomatic. The next best step in management of this patient with a metastatic renal tumor is... left total nephroureterectomy with lymph node sampling. Lung metastasis with a unilateral Wilms tumor does not preclude an upfront resection of the abdominal tumor. In Wilms tumor, staging consists of an abdominal, in other words, local stage and a disease stage. Local stage determines the treatment of the abdomen and disease stage is the overall burden of disease, including lung treatment. This child can be staged to locally, yet have overall stage four disease. Although she'll certainly need three drug chemotherapy and lung radiation due to metastatic pulmonary disease, if a biopsy was done, this would locally upstage the child and mean that she would additionally need abdominal radiation. A five centimeter tumor is small, poses limited risk of rupture, and is easily removed. Partial nephrectomy is contraindicated in almost all children with unilateral Wilms tumors for several reasons. Although technically feasible, the premalignant lesions excuse me, the Wilms tumor developed from clonal expansion of nephrogenic breasts, which are multifocal within the kidneys of most children with Wilms tumors. Thus, pre-malignant lesions could be left behind. Second, the rate of renal failure at 40 years in patients with Wilms tumors is 0.9%. Thus, renal failure is not a long-term complication, and there is a high risk of positive margins when doing partial nephrectomies, which exposes the child to increased chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and their late effects. Partial nephrectomies are only indicated in children with bilateral Wilms tumors, a single kidney, or high-risk patients with unilateral disease, such as Beckwith-Weedman syndrome. An intraoperative biopsy followed by nephrectomy at the same operation if found to be Wilms tumors is appropriate as this would upstage the child to stage 3. Biopsies are only needed if the tumor is unresectable, and there are clinical situations where it's agreed that primary nephrectomy is contraindicated and these include when there is extension of tumor thrombus above the level of the hepatic veins. The tumor involves contiguous structures whereby the only means of removing the kidney tumor requires removal of the other structures, in other words, spleen, pancreas, colon, um, but the adrenal gland is okay. Bilateral tumors, tumor in a solitary kidney, or if there's pulmonary compromise due to extensive pulmonary metastases. Question six. You resect an 8 centimeter left adrenocortical carcinoma from a 6 year old girl with a wild type TP53. Two years later, a surveillance chest radiograph shows a single metastasis in the left lung. The best treatment for this child with metastatic adrenocortical carcinoma is... While better understanding of the biology of adrenocortical carcinoma raises hope for novel chemotherapy regimens, neither mitotane nor radiation therapy have been shown to have any survival advantage. With a disease-free interval of over 12 months, metastectomy has been shown in older children and adults to have a 5-year survival of 
A review of all resections for recurrent or metastatic adrenal cortical carcinoma was performed to identify patients who might benefit from a surgical approach and to identify factors that might aid in prognosis among patients with metastatic disease. Furthermore, a retrospective review was performed of all patients who underwent surgical intervention in a, um, in a single tertiary uh, center, and they found that um, of those patients, 57 underwent 116 procedures for recurrent or metastatic disease, with a median survival with a disease-free interval less than 12 months was 1.7 years. Liver mets um, were more common with right-sided primaries. Chemotherapy was found to have no impact on survival. Resection of recurrent or metastatic adrenal cortical carcinoma is safe, and it can result in prolongation of survival in selected patients um, with a, a disease-free interval greater than one year. <coughs> Question 7. A 7-year-old has a 3-year history of recurrent fever, cough, and left lower lobe pneumonia. A chest radiograph reveals left lower lobe consolidation. The computerized tomography scan is shown. Core needle biopsy shows calcification and dense fibrosis with spindle and lymphoplasmacytic cells. The final pathologic diagnosis is inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, in other words, pseudotumor. The next best step for this patient with a lung mass is. left lower pulmonary lobectomy. This is an unusual lesion, um, and it's known by, again, several different names, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, plasma cell granuloma, inflammatory pseudotumor, fibrous histiocytoma, fibroxanthoma, and xanthogranuloma. Similar inflammatory pseudotumors can develop elsewhere, such as the spleen, liver, orbit, skull, thyroid, etc., although the majority of cases occur in patients under 40 years of age. Um, children are not at higher risk. There is no gender or ethnic predilection. The etiology may be primarily inflammatory or it may be a low-grade malignant process inciting a pronounced inflammatory reaction. The clinical presentation of IMT in the lung is variable. Nearly 75% is asymptomatic. Many have had prior diagnosis of pneumonia, cough, fever, and chest pain. You might find um, an elevation in your acute phase reactants as well as thrombocytosis. Bronchoscopy and needle biopsy are reasonable initial diagnostic modalities, but the yield is variable. Complete surgical resection is the treatment of choice for IMT. Glucocorticoids, radiotherapy, NSAIDs, and chemo have all been used for unresectable disease, with unfortunately mixed results. Complete surgical resection usually provides a long-term cure. Ability to attain complete resection and smaller tumor size, especially less than or equal to 3 centimeters, are both positive prognostic factors. Um, some IMTs, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors, are locally invasive into the mediastinum, diaphragm, chest wall, vertebral bodies, heart, and even the major vessels. Question 8. A 12-year-old boy has undergone surgical resection of an osteosarcoma of the right femur. He receives appropriate treatment with chemotherapy. <clears throat> Within one year of the initial diagnosis, he's found to have two nodules in the left lung on CT scan. They were resected for assessment of etiology using thoracoscopic techniques with ultrasound guidance. There are no other obvious lesions. Pathology reveals a completely necrotic tumor in both nodules. The next best step in management of this patient with an osteosarcoma and lung nodules is which? left thoracotomy for exploration. Multiple reports have demonstrated the survival benefit of excising metastatic pulmonary nodules from osteosarcoma. Survival is improved if the lesions are peripheral as opposed to central and if there are relatively few lesions. Multiple resection procedures are also justified if the lesions recur. There's been some discussion as to how to manage a patient who has lesions that are demonstrated in only one lung on CT imaging and whether thoracoscopic management may suffice as opposed to thoracotomy. Um, at Sloan Kettering, they did a study that showed um, there is a notable instance of bilateral disease, even though only unilateral disease is demonstrated on CT scan, and often that nodules represent tumor necrosis should be treated as positive metastatic lesions.
Um, they've also demonstrated that CT scan tends to underestimate the number of nodules present in the setting of pulmonary metastases from osteosarcoma, and that thoracoscopic examination does have a tendency to miss lesions that are present but not demonstrated on CT scan. The other thing they've shown is that on CT scan, you cannot necessarily differentiate malignant from benign pulmonary nodules in the setting of osteosarcoma. So in the situation that we have here, it wouldn't be sufficient to rely on imaging alone or a thoracoscopic exam where, again, you don't have that tactile feedback to determine the definitive metastatic tumor deposits. So current COG surgical recommendations suggest that open unilateral thoracotomy is required, and even bilateral thoracotomy should be considered, but it's not mandatory. The potential role of thoracoscopy is still under current evaluation, um, as noted by several recent articles. Question 9. A 4-year-old child presents with a 14-centimeter mass involving the hilum of the right kidney with radiographic features consistent with Wilms tumor. The chest CT scan at diagnosis shows a single 1.2 centimeter pulmonary nodule in the left lower lobe felt to be consistent with metastatic disease. The child undergoes a right radical nephrectomy with lymph node dissection. Pathology shows a favorable histology with no loss of heterozygosity at chromosomes 1p and 16q. Two of the five lymph nodes are positive for tumor, and this is the chest CT scan. <clears throat> After completing adjuvant chemotherapy with vincristin, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin, a chest x-ray shows persistent residual um, disease at the site of the left lower lobe pulmonary lesion. Your recommendation for management of this patient with metastatic Wilms tumor is... <coughs> thoracoscopic biopsy of the residual lesion. Lung metastasis is the most common site of stage 4 disease in children with Wilms tumor. Lung mets, however, do not necessarily imply that the abdominal tumor is unresectable. A common surgical pitfall is not to attempt upfront resection of the abdominal tumor just because lung mets are visualized. The abdominal tumor should be removed and staged locally if possible. It's not generally necessary to biopsy or resect pulmonary nodules at the time of the initial primary tumor resection. There are three situations when a surgeon might be asked to remove a pulmonary nodule. The first is that diagnosis if the diagnosis of metastatic disease is in doubt. In the case of small lesions seen on CT but not chest radiograph, um, in other words, CT only nodules, there's a 70 to 80% chance that the nodules are tumors. The second indication in the topic of this question is if lung lesions shrink but don't completely go away after chemotherapy. It's important to discern whether the residual lesions contain viable tumor tissue. So the third situation um, is if a tumor remains after both chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which then requires surgical resection for cure. Most Wilms tumors metastases are peripheral and superficial, and many of these lesions can be fully excised by, um, by video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. And that's it for lung and chest wall tumors. Um, as always, thank you so much for your attention.